start now, exactly. Uh, ID is like putting us back on track. So, um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. We are very happy to have with us uh, today Balihar Sanghera, uh, who is uh, actually, we were just talking uh, about this. He's also like uh, an old friend of the Open University because he's been collaborating with us 20 years ago. And I wasn't there, so, <laughs> but Roberto can confirm. Um, and yeah, so we are very happy to host him. We had uh, actually planned these seminars back uh, last March, but for obvious reason, we couldn't then have it in person, but we were really keen to have you here. So I'm super glad that you accepted to present um, with us uh, online today. And uh, um, yeah, Baligan Targhera is a senior lecturer in sociology at the Open, uh, the, no, not at the Open University, the University of Kent. Um, and his research interests are on the political and moral economy of Eurasia, and he explores how economic institutional relationships relate to moral values and norms. Uh, his current research, which is part of, the, um, of his presentation today, is on rentier capitalism in post-Soviet economies, power, morality and resistance. Um, so, uh, Balihar will present for around 40-45 minutes and then we will have uh, the opportunity to, for having like Q&A. Uh, please keep your uh, microphone muted. I'm talking to the participants now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, whether this event is going to be recorded, so it's being recorded. So uh, if you want to uh, ask questions but remain anonymous, please um, write your question on the chat box and we will, uh, uh, yeah, say it like loud to uh, Balihar. So without further ado, I'll uh, give the floor to Balihar and um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Lorena, for the invitation. Um, uh, it is great that I uh, uh, have, had, have got this opportunity uh, to make this presentation, but also actually, as, as we were saying earlier, to reconnect with, uh, with colleagues from the past, uh, colleagues whose work I've much admired, uh, especially in their teaching and writing on heterodox economics. I've, I've always admired what you know um, Maureen Roberto and Andrew Trigg and, and others have done uh, in trying to further an alternative form of economic perspective and thinking. And, uh, and, it's, and it's a great privilege for me to, to be able to present to, uh, 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 to you guys, hopefully in the same vein of trying to introduce uh, alternative heterodox economic, economic thought. Um, so this uh, this this talk is part of a book that both myself and uh, uh, Amira uh, Chattabadeva, my my partner, are writing on. So I would value your comments, um, uh, things that you think I'm missing or things that I haven't quite quite got right. Um, so anything that can uh, can help to uh, 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 bring the book to uh, 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 a, a, a proper a proper audience. So. Um, I've suddenly changed the title to, uh, to the one that was advertised. Um, I think it's slightly more snappier than the other one, but uh, um, but it, it, the content is, is more or less the same. Um, oh, sorry, just going on to. So let me just explain what the um, <coughs> the aim of this talk is, and as well as some of the research questions. So, firstly, uh, uh, I'll be uh, explaining and evaluating the nature of volunteer activities in Central Asia. I will be a bit more clear about what I, what I mean by volunteer activities. Uh, then uh, this talk will try to introduce the moral economy perspective, especially drawing on the works of Andrew Sayer. Um, this talk uh, is based on uh, uh, field work that both myself and Almira have, have been doing for the last three years or so both doing quality research, but also archival research as well. And um, in terms of the research questions, they really can be divided into three, I think, very simple uh, uh, questions. Firstly, uh, how was volunteership facilitated and justified in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan? Uh, what were its effects, especially its, uh, its negative effects, and how was it how, how was volunteership resisted? 
Um, and the outline of this talk will be will follow like 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 so. Um, firstly, I will talk uh, about how I'm using the term rentier, um, what it what it refers to. Say something a bit, a bit about the uh, moral economy perspective, um, because I suspect this may not be familiar to 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 many of you. So, so just give you a very simple and uh, brief overview of that. Then uh, uh, describe the the rise of the rentier class in Central Asia, uh, particularly uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. I mean, these are the two countries that I will be uh, focusing on. How uh, neoliberalism has promoted and justified a uh, rentiership, uh, the uh, legal and judicial mechanism that has protected uh, uh, the, the, the rentier class, and then uh, more on the, the damaging effects of rentiership uh, in, uh, on, on, on three spheres, uh, the politics, crime, and the environment. Uh, then uh, getting towards the end, looking at some of the uh, resistance that has uh, spawned uh, against rotation, uh, and then finally end with some uh, theoretical and policy implications. I hope to do all this in 40, 40, 40 minutes or so, um, and I'm sure I will be, uh, 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 will be uh, timed well by, by, by Lorena. So first, about the two this 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 is an unfamiliar concept to, to many of you, uh, but simply it refers to uh, um, extracting rent on the mere basis of ownership and control of scarce existing assets. Now, I suspect some of you will be familiar with, uh, with the traditional form of uh, rent extraction through oil, gas, and minerals. Um, and maybe also around land as well, uh, property. But it, it also uh, uh, involves other assets as well, such as credit money, financial assets like shares, bonds, um, also radio spectrums, uh, what's sometimes referred to as virtual uh, estate, um, intellectual property, uh, copyrights, trade, uh, trademarks, uh, digital, and then more newer forms are things around the digital platforms and uh, service contracts. And uh, 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 rentiers are uh, able to receive a stream of income on the mere basis of having property rights. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's, that's how they get their, their income, just by the mere basis of having uh, 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 property over the assets and getting the uh, income stream from it. And um, this is sometimes being labeled as unearned income to distinguish it from uh, earned income. And this is a, an important uh, distinction in moral economic thought, um, a, 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 a distinction that was well made by classical political economists uh, from, uh, from Adam Smith all the way to uh, uh, Hob uh, Hobson. Um, where they argued that unearned income, this volunteer income, this uh, income that is extracted on the mere basis of ownership, does not involve work. It does not involve creative work at all. Um, and in fact, Adam Smith talked about how uh, landowners are able to get income, uh, um, uh, but on the, on, on the without uh, sort of reaping what they have not sown. I mean, that was his quote reaping what they have not sown. And uh, uh, John Stuart Mill talks about uh, how uh, rentiers are able to make money in their sleep um, without having any uh, claim for social justice for their richness. Um, so it is an important distinction which sadly has been lost in, in more contemporary economic times uh, where we tend to conflate these two and just assume that any form of profit making is, is justifiable. But as I said, in classical political economy, they did make this important distinction. And more recent, and in the uh, uh, early 20th century, the works of R.H. Tony and Hobson, and of course, uh, John Maynard Keynes have been important, were important in trying to hold on to this distinction, which as I said, got lost with neoliberalism. 
moral economy. Um, this is uh, a perspective that I draw upon the work of Andrew Sayer. Uh, and this, it, it, it argues that all economies are moral economies by the very virtue that uh, uh, moral sentiments, norms, rules, and discourses shape economic practices. And in, their, and in, and in return, these uh, 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 norms and rules are, are either reinforced or compromised or overridden by economic power and pressure. Um, and so it's important to see the current uh, 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 capitalist form as a moral economy, um, because it is underpinned by moral factors uh, 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 around uh, uh, discourses about property rights, uh, around norms about uh, uh, the sanctity of, um, of, of, of contracts and uh, honouring one's debt. These are all moral discourses that help to shape economic relationships and institutions. I think there's also another important part to this uh, a moral economy that is not just merely an object of study, but is also a perspective which allows us to evaluate economic relationships and institutions in terms of their effects on people's lives. And I think this is a, a, an important point to, to, uh, to think about because it's not merely enough to, to describe and explain economic activities and relationships, but also to evaluate them. There's a tendency uh, within our contemporary disciplines to to, to just to fix uh, to just to concentrate on the on on, on what's called positive economic or positive thinking, positive statement about how the world is, without thinking about normative elements of our inquiry, what the world ought to be, what are the damaging effects, what are the, the effects on people's lives. And in doing so, what moral economy does is to bring these normative together, intertwined. Uh, in many ways, just like Adam Smith did uh, before we started having disciplines, uh, fixed disciplines like economics, politics, and ethics. Uh, for, you know, he was after all a professor in moral philosophy uh, at uh, 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 Edinburgh, um, uh, sorry, Glasgow. Um, and, and, and also more contemporary, you know, uh, works of uh, Marcia Sen also tried to bring ethics and economics together. And what, what moral economy recognises is that um, uh, we can't but avoid uh, um, thinking about normative implication because economic arrangements affect human flourishing. So by the very fact that this does this, we have to engage in ethical deliberations as well. So more about the, uh, uh, the uh, work on Central Asia. So um, the term rentier, as I said, may be familiar to, to, to some of you working in, in Central Asia, but it tends to be very narrow, narrowly defined. Uh, it usually focuses around natural resources. So we think about the state as a rentier state, especially Kazakhstan or uh, Azerbaijan as, as, as key examples of rentier actors. Or more broadly, uh, it's, it's usually focused uh, on uh, political, um, uh, political actors, um, the uh, state, uh, state officials. And this is largely through the work of uh, people like James Buchanan, who, who usually equate rentier rent seeking with political corruption uh, through their work on, on public choice theory. Um, but what they tend to miss and neglect is how private actors, um, uh, capitalists, investors are also rent seeking. That just tends to get missed out. Um, so what I provide uh, in this talk is a more broader scope of understanding uh, rent seeking beyond the narrowly defined either in terms of uh, uh, natural resources or around uh, public sector. Uh, so it's much more routine, common and varied. So it would include things like uh, interest, mortgages, dividend payments, capital, uh, capital gains, quasi-monopoly prices, grand, uh, grand rent, housing, and property rent, 
charges we make to using internet, uh, license fees, insurance and royalties. So as you can see, it's a broad scope uh, that we have here about rent seeking. In addition to this, uh, um, uh, there are also uh, economic groups who are who we can call uh, rentiers at one removed. Uh, they themselves rentiers, but they help to facilitate the rentier class. Uh, so they're part of the uh, rentier ecology because they act as intermediaries. By their very activities, they allow rentiers to engage in their rent-seeking behavior. So it would include things like, so, so th these groups would include property developers, uh, construction companies, help to build uh, 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 luxurious apartments, which are then used for mere renting. Um, or corporate accountants and lawyers who are involved in acquisitions of uh, property and companies uh, merely to asset strip or, or, or to sell at a later point. This is a form of kind of capital gains that occurs, as well as also it would include financial advisors who uh, enable investors to, uh, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, they get, they, they put their money or squirrel their money away in tax havens or, or to uh, uh, a more profitable uh, avenues in order to uh, make uh, profit, further, further profit. Now, what we see is that if you understand uh, rentier in, uh, and the rentier class and rent seeking this broader sphere that I've just outlined, that what you get in, in, in Kazakhstan amongst the top 10 richest individuals is that they, they've acquired their wealth through rent seeking behavior, uh, not just merely through uh, natural, natural resources, or through corruption in the public sector, but through banking, through real estate, through telecommunication, uh, through intellectual property, as in the case of the first one there, uh, Vladimir Kim. Uh, but also it goes on. I mean, so you can see that list on the, uh, the, the right hand side under the uh, main economic sectors. You can see the importance of banking, finance, real estate, ownership of uh, uh, shopping malls, which form a natural monopoly, and they are able to uh, acquire rent on the basis of that. Um, you, you can see how the, the, the richest individuals in, in, Central, in, in Kazakhstan acquired their wealth through rent seeking, through rentier activities. And likewise with uh, Kyrgyzstan as well. Um, uh, this is a slightly older list, uh, but again, it shows you uh, the, again the richest ten individuals. Uh, again, how did they acquire their wealth? Uh, it was through rentier activities. Again, banking shows up there uh, and minerals to some extent. But what's interesting about this list uh, is that the rentiers here tend to acquire more through shopping malls and uh, real estate. Uh, as vehicles of rent extraction. Um, um, uh, construction is also important there as well as uh, uh, for, 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 for several of them. Um, ownership of uh, uh, microfinance companies was also an important vehicle for some of these uh, 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 rentiers. Now, so how did we get to this state uh, of these uh, rentiers, the rise of the rentier class in, uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Well, it was facilitated by neoliberalism. Um, we know that, uh, that that works of Hayek, for instance, was, was very important in providing a, a critique to, to state socialism. Uh, you know, so, it, so its argument was that uh, through state intervention, this would slowly erode uh, uh, individuals' liberties such that we would end his famous uh, title of his book, The Road to Serfdom. And so he argued in, 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 in that work and other neoliberal colleagues uh, uh, argued that in order to avoid this, we need to ensure a free market. Now, what's interesting about their notion of free market is that it's a reversal of classical uh, uh, notion of the free market. For, for classical political economists, Adam Smith, Ricardo, uh, uh, John Stuart Mills, uh, as well as more uh, uh, later economists, 
Mills, um, Keynes, uh, Tony, and uh, Hobson. For them, the free market was uh, was envisaged to be free of economic rent and interest and other and feudal and special privileges. So that's what it meant for them, right? The way they used the term free market was that uh, it should shore up. So it should, it should enable the economy to be free of this unearned income that was quite pervasive uh, in the 17th, 18th century. And they wanted uh, a, 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 a movement which would uh, uh, deprive uh, the aristocracy, the landed gentry, the chartered companies, the monopolies uh, that, that got their privileges through the state. Uh, they wanted to deprive them because they argued that all these actors did was just to add to the cost of production. They didn't do nothing else. They just added to the burden uh, of economic activity. They were a dead weight loss, they argued. And so we needed to get rid of them because they didn't do anything. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, after all, mere ownership produces nothing. And they clearly didn't produce anything. Um, they, as I said, just obtained income uh, just through ownership and nothing else. But they had that, but they had this power, the power of property rights over these assets, which enabled them to extract rent uh, from others. Um, so for them, uh, for classical political economists, uh, state intervention, state regulation was not a road to serfdom, but a way from it. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, Marx also later also talked about the importance of getting rid of parasites who do nothing uh, but just uh, uh, add uh, and uh, just, just add to the debt of, of, of people. Um, so what neoliberalism has done quite sleight of hand in many ways uh, is to use this term, uh, uh, the free market, but but they have turned it to meaning free of government regulation and to allow individual actors to, to be free to extract income. Right? So for them, the free market is, is, a, 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 um, is, is a way, contrary to classical political economy, to allow uh, owners, property owners, to extract income. And in doing so, what neoliberalism did was it helped to facilitate and justify the expansion of various sources of rent. And we've seen that uh, in, the, in the previous slide that I, that I showed you. There's been uh, numerous ways in uh, Central Asia, uh, various mechanisms that have been used to uh, promote and expand uh, uh, rent seeking. Clearly, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we, we saw uh, a, a, a neoliberal program of privatization, liberalization, and deregulation, which empowered and enriched the frontier. So we had a transfer of uh, scarce assets, invariably in case of Kazakhstan, natural resources from the state to, uh, to, to the private sector, in particular, foreign actors. The foreign actors, uh, foreign investors did extremely well in the nineteen uh, in the early nineteen nineties. Chevron acquiring Tengiz uh, uh, oil fields, um, and in Ashagan, uh, Mobile, uh, 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 Total, and BP likewise. Um, but what's also interesting is that where is it under the Soviet Union, um, um, unearned income was criminalized. It was it was seen as illegal. What neoliberalism with, 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 uh, with, with the reforms of market reforms, they legalized the right to unearned income and legalized the ability of property owners to make money through rent and speculation. And so they decriminalized what in the Soviet Union was seen as unearned income and mere speculation. That became acceptable. It became uh, the new uh, rule to the game. So hence we see this kind of expansion occurring uh, after the first decade of independence in uh, Central Asia. What's also occurred is, is what Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen Gills calls the emergence of neoliberal constitutionalism, 
which help to lock in the rights of investors uh, against uh, state expropriation. And, and this was important for foreign investors because they were investing in, uh, 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 um, in uh, sectors like the natural, in particular the, the, uh, in, in particular the, the, uh, uh, the natural resource sector. And they wanted guarantees. They wanted guarantees that the state would not expropriate them, either directly or through indirect means, either directly by nationalization or by slow creeping form of exp uh, expropriation through uh, uh, taxes and uh, uh, through extra charges, etc., etc. They wanted economic liberty, economic freedom, and the ability to appropriate their returns without the state uh, uh, jeopardizing that. And so, uh, um, um, you had a flourishing, uh, so a, 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 uh, a mushroom of various treaties, uh, the bilateral investment treaties that were signed between states to guarantee and to lock in the rights of investors and ensure what's sometimes called the stability clauses within their uh, contracts, their oil contracts or mineral contracts, so that once the contract was signed, it could not be reneged, it could not be changed, the stability clauses. So if future governments wanted to, to, to change parts of the contract to ensure more taxes, uh, they just couldn't do it, right? Because you had the, uh, 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 the, these treaties guaranteeing the, the stability and, uh, uh, of, of, of the contracts that were signed. And what's interesting is that when these contracts were signed in the first decade of independence, it was an unequal relationship between the state and the transnational actors. It was the transnational actors who had more power and they were able to dictate terms and conditions to the uh, weaker states. Now, should the state try to, uh, 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 try to appropriate or to change some of the contract because they think it's unfair, quite rightly think it's unfair, then the investors uh, can take the, uh, the state to the court of arbitration. And this is an undemocratic uh, institution uh, con con consisting of uh, three uh, uh, jurors uh, who, in never who it, is, it, is, it is argued uh, uh, have inherent interest to side with the investors. And uh, in another paper that uh, Almer and I have done, we look into the various uh, state investor state disputes and how have these been arbitrated and in many cases they've sided with the investor and against the state um, and, uh, and 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 the third element to these uh, uh, governance mechanisms uh, that we have call is the use of the, uh, the the rule of law agenda and the judiciary to uphold uh, the rights of property owners and to rectify any violations that the property owners may, may have experienced. So there have been uh, a, 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 a articulation of moral discourses around property rights, uh, the sanctity of contracts, and honouring one's promises, especially in relation to debt, that you ought to pay off your debt. It is somehow unvirtuous if you did not pay off your debt. These uh, uh, moral legal discourses have been used and have become embedded within the judiciary, which have been invariably sided with, or rather have tended to side with, uh, with, with property owners and, and investors. What has been the effects of this? So, so hopefully I've given you an understanding of, of, of how uh, uh, Rontier uh, became established, what were the various mechanisms, so what were the effects? And I want to highlight three kinds of effects. Firstly, on the politics. So it is uh, uh, often the case that, uh, that political elites are allied to rentier interests by the very fact that they can own scarce assets. And in that list that I showed earlier about the top 10 uh, richest uh, uh, individuals, in another paper, I look, I look at the top 20 richest individuals in Kazakhstan. And many, and, and, and the really top ones, the top four or five, were closely aligned, closely linked to uh, the then president, uh, Nazarbayev. Uh, one was the son-in-law, the other one was the daughter, and two were close chums of uh, Nazarbayev. 
and the others have benefited from his patronage. For Kazakhstan, for Kyrgyzstan, uh, what we see is amongst the top 20 rich list that many of them have held uh, senior political positions. Um, some of them have been uh, prime ministers or uh, one of them has been a president. Uh, several of them have occupied uh, cabinet positions. Uh, some have also held uh, positions as city mayors, speakers of parliament, as well as just being parliamentarians. So there is a strong intertwining between economic concentration of power and political concentration of power. And I think what also tends to get missed here is not just this, what I call the rise of. So these volunteers are plutocrats, uh, insofar as we have the rule of the rich. It's not so much as the oligarchs. Oligarchs means from the Greek, the rule of the few. It's not just the few, it's the rule of the rich plutocracy that we are seeing in Central Asia. Um, and uh, in, in light of uh, what I was saying about uh, uh, neoliberal constitutionalism, what this has done is by locking in the rights of investors, it has limited uh, state intervention and also has curtailed democratic decision-making because uh, uh, local communities and uh, uh, um, uh, 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 national, legis uh, national legislative bodies can't change the contracts. They are, they are prohibited to, to, to do so because you have these treaties, arbitra uh, uh, arbitration courts uh, that, uh, and stability clauses in the uh, 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 oil, oil contracts and mineral contracts that prohibit any changes. So it limits, it, 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 it ensures the status quo the status quo of inequality between investors and the state at the expense of uh, uh, local communities who are unable to bring about change to contracts. And these contracts last over 20, 30 years. Oh, so, so, so this was just a, a figure that, um, uh, that both myself and Amira have uh, uh, devised um, based on our uh, uh, looking through newspaper articles. Um, and what we see here is within the parliament in Kazakhstan, so in Kyrgyzstan, a lot, this was a sample of 71 deputies uh, out of 120 or so. Most of them had uh, significant ownership of assets in various economic sectors. And what you see, if I can just you know, highlight for you, is their ownership around uh, rents, uh, rent extracting sectors, uh, the real estate, land, energy, minerals, finance, shopping malls, but also those that are closely connected to rent seeking construction and building materials that help to facilitate this frontier ecology that I was talking about earlier. Baliha, you have 10 minutes. Great. I think I think I think I, I think I should be able to do this. Um, the 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 second uh, level of, of harmful effect relates to crime because neoliberalism didn't just only promote rotation and photocracy, but it's also uh, facilitated a weakened regulatory settlements, criminogenic environments, and uh, uh, corruption. So we see, especially in the microfinance sector in Kyrgyzstan, uh, significant predatory lending to uh, subprime groups, um, contracts that were written in Russian, where most of the speakers, so most of the borrowers only speak uh, Kazakh, so Kyrgyz. Numerous uh, financial uh, uh, malpractices and fraud took place in both uh, Kyrgyzstan and in the banking sector in Kazakhstan. Within the, uh, in our work that we've done on uh, construction companies, we've also seen significant violation of building codes, mis-selling to customers, as well as bribery to the planning, to, to individuals working in the mayor's office or the planning department given the bribes so that they can have allocation of land to build luxurious apartments. Uh, and what we see in the oil sector, um, in, especially in, uh, in, in, in Kazakhstan, is illegal drilling at the wrong depth uh, and un uh, uh, unsafe storage of sulfide and other toxic uh, chemicals, labor violations, especially at the subcontractual level, uh, manipulation of data on, on pollution, 
because uh, because of the lack of uh, uh, state regulatory capacity, a lot of the uh, uh, collection of data on pollution is carried out by the companies themselves. So they have a, an invested interest to underreport toxic pollution. And there's, uh, you know, so there's been a couple of stories around how uh, Chevron uh, deliberately underreported uh, uh, pollution. And also how, in the case of Chevron, it used its, its political connections, its political capital, as Borgia would say, to alter laws on the environment, to make storage of sulfur uh, permittable, rather than whereas before it, it, it incurred a fine. And what we also, and the third level of, uh, of harmful effects concerns, of course, the, the, the environment. The, and then in, in the case of the uh, natural the natural resource sector, the the way the uh, contracts were drawn up, they were, it used what's called production sharing agreements or PCAs, and this was the main vehicle in which the state and investors signed their deals. It invariably uh, benefited the uh, the investors who had then ownership of part ownership. Of, of things that they extracted from the ground. It wasn't a technical contract, which is what the state wanted in particular Kazakhstan. That's what they wanted. But Chevron uh, used its power and its influence to say no, and it was only going to consider production sharing agreements. And what this has enabled is the transnational companies to plunder the earth at ever greater speed uh, with damaging consequences. Uh, so in, in Tengiz and, and Ashagan oil fields, this this excessive uh, pace in which uh, rent in which extraction resources occurs has lost has led to loss of diversity, biodiversity, high levels of toxin uh, uh, within the community, people experiencing breathing breathing problems, skin diseases, also the development of acid rain, which has potential to go to Europe. And in, uh, in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in the, 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 the Komtur gold mine, what we've seen is the rapid shrinkage of uh, the mountain glaciers, the pollution of rivers as a result of the mining tailings that they used to clean uh, the, the mines and the destabilized natural uh, lakes. Now, so, um, so I've just got a couple more slides and then, and then I'm done. So, so hopefully you get the idea of that that volunteership has not been necessarily has not been beneficial. It has actually produced a lot of harmful effects. So, and it's only natural then that we have that we had and we saw uh, grassroots movements that responded to these harms that were taking place in their everyday lives. And uh, using the concept of uh, by from 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 Polanyi, the double movement, is it how local groups try to uh, assert and to democratize uh, social control over the free market uh, society. And, uh, and, and this is work that Amira has done, uh, uh, has, has focused particularly uh, uh, more than me. She has looked into uh, the anti-debt movement, uh, which, were, which, was, which, which was gendered. It was largely led by women. Why was it led by women? Because the, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the microfinance companies who later turned into commercial banks uh, pretty targeted women because they were seen as, as more reliable to pay back. So when these women then incurred huge debts, struggling to pay off their debts, uh, uh, and they experienced uh, uh, malfeasance, uh, they then started to campaign for better regulation of the uh, sector. So they've been campaigning for capping the interest rates and especially the penalties that they incur. They want to prohibit the extrajudicial uh, 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 repossession of properties uh, because uh, the, the banks sometimes would just ignore what the court said and just take possession. And what, what the anti-debt movement, both in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, said no, it has to be done through the judiciary, it has to be approved by the courts. And they've also tried to tackle all sorts of uh, uh, malfeasance within the sector. Um, they need to get uh, uh, some state, uh, some state debt relief. Um, 
at the moment is only gone to the very few, especially in Kazakhstan, uh, to the very uh, uh, a small minority of the uh, debtors. We've also seen the environmental movements campaigning for greater accountability, responsibility and compensation for uh, 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 environmental damage, as you would expect. What you would, uh, what you, well, what's also occurred with is greater trade union involvement, especially in trying to defend local, local workers uh, who have been exploited by the uh, industry. Uh, and finally, on this one, um, we saw, uh, especially in the major cities, major capitals, Bishkek uh, uh, and Astana, Astana to, to, to a less extent, but certainly in Almaty, the informal settlement movements, whereby the rural migrants came to the cities, uh, 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 seized land in order to uh, 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 have housing for themselves because housing was too expensive. The only kind of housing that were, 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 were being built were for the rich. And so this was their way of trying to get accommodation, trying to get housing by seizing land on the outskirts, usually vacant idle lands. And uh, more recently, they, they tried to ask for the state to shore up uh, social uh, and physical uh, infrastructure investment, electricity, schools, uh, uh, sanitation in these otherwise uh, 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 very squalid uh, conditions in which they uh, live in. Okay. And then finally, on the implications then. So what do I think are the uh, implications? Oh, by the way, just, just to go to, to this one on, on the grassroots to resistance, I should note uh, that, these, that these movements have attempted to assert and to democratize social control. By and large, it's been uh, a battle of, 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 of uh, David versus Goliath, uh, in which David doesn't win. <laughs> um, in, in, uh, although they've, they've campaigned, I think, very uh, 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 forcefully for their, for their point of view, uh, the state just hasn't relinquished, uh, partly because of the various uh, 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 judicial mechanism that has prevented them to do so, but also because some of the state actors are also benefit from raunchy activities themselves. So what are the implications? So let me just divide this into uh, uh, theoretical as well as policy. So I think theoretically, I think what I, I like to think is that this presentation has shown the need to assess economic relations and practices for human flourishing. Uh, we can't, uh, we've got to combine uh, the positive with the normative, and we can't assume that there's this disciplinary divide between, uh, 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 between economics and uh, uh, ethics. In the past, scholars like uh, uh, Adam Smith, as well as more recent ones, uh, Marcia Sen, have, have tried to uh, reignite and intertwine these things together. And we need to do this because the effect of economic relationships on our lives. Secondly, I think I would like to uh, say that uh, we need to expand the notion of rent seeking beyond just the economic uh, uh, sector and the natural resources. To, it, it, it's much more varied and much more common, as I uh, uh, explained. Importantly, to see the state as a facilitator and a regulator of uh, uh, rent relations. Um, so rather than trying to decenter the state or trying to marginalize the state, I actually think the state needs to be brought back into, into, into analysis uh, because it's so important in how rent is uh, regulated and facilitated, but also because the state is the site for the production and distribution of rent, you know, where different forces struggle in, the, in, 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 in for control over property and rent. So I think it, it's important for us to, 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 to acknowledge that, uh, that the state is a site that needs to be uh, fought over. Um, and in terms of policy-wise, I think it's about trying to limit the nature and extent of unearned income through democratic ways. So, uh, you know, having controls on rent, interest, for instance, uh, uh, higher taxes on capital gains, and more radical, perhaps, is to uh, uh, limit the property ownership. 
Uh, why is it that those richest individuals need to own so much, so many apartments? What is it? I mean, in some cases, they had 10, 10, 10 apartments. It's not as if they can live in these 10 apartments uh, at one time. Do they go around each day of the, of, of the week living in apartments? Clearly not. They are they're, they're acquiring uh, these apartments for exchange, uh, for, for exchange value only, not for use value, of uh, what Hobson called improperty. These are examples of improperty rather than property, because improperty uh, just focuses on uh, uh, extraction for purely for exchange value rather than use value. And in some cases, I think we would want to see certain, certain sectors to be nationalised. OK, and that's me done. Yes, thank you very much, Balikar, for the very empirically and theoretically rich presentation and perfectly timed. Uh, it's been very interesting and we already have um, questions from the participants. Uh, I have a list based on the uh, order of appearance or better way in a way that appeared to me. Uh, so I have Montu, um, Quad, and then Farwa. So I will just give the floor to Montu and um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. If you um, can briefly introduce yourself, guys. Oh, Thank uh, you. Uh, Montu Saxena from uh, University of Cambridge, uh, Central Asia Forum, a uh, great fan of both the organizer and the speaker. Uh, so uh, on that note, um, uh, you know, it, it's sort of the, the, you paint the vivid picture of Central Asia, but it, right now it feels like you're talking about here, <laughs> where, you know, it's was playing out on, on, on the, the, the Western British or American, you know, seeing very similar things we're seeing. But anyway, that's not the, not the question. The question I had was first one uh, regarding the analysis. So when we look at these names, uh, you know, the list of people, uh, and we know what the connections are, but when we look at the uh, other, uh, you know, the, the, the foreign parties, so we talk about institutions, yeah, um, uh, we talk about Chevron or or other other things. So it's get depersonalized. We we don't have an idea of who these actors are. Just two points. One is that are there question are uh, can we access the people who are party to some of those activities? Uh, so in, in a in a sort of a sense of mode of analysis, or are we seeing actually something more that that these things are being agreed upon at a corporate level, and then being acted out? So there will be a kind of a difference in how the you know uh, the, the mode of that moral economy you know develops develops and evolves and who are you know who has the agency and you know who acts it out uh, and uh, and on a similar theme uh, we see for instance uh, the emergence of things like Asana International Financial Center in which British law or other law is being brought in and I, I wondered how you see that uh, the bolstering which side of the story because being brought in by state in in principle, but by those people and how this link is being built from outside. Uh, and just a uh, the final comment or uh, rather question is regarding the grassroots gender thing. So one question was that the, the Kyrgyz case is very clear uh, as you make it. Um, was Do we see similar gender uh, sort of a flavor in Kazakhstan as well? Uh, but also uh, it's important in a sense to uh, point out that how the particular industrial decay in Kyrgyzstan affected this gender story and how the migration of male actors going out and female actors being more mostly responsible for economic activity may, you know, I think it also, yeah, it's not mainly the fact that they were seen as people who could pay back. They were the only people working at all locally to, uh, to contribute. Yeah, those are the few points I wanted to kind of clarify. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks. Sir. Thanks, thanks, Monte, for, for those excellent questions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are accounts where uh, people do talk about more the the, uh, the minutiae details of how contracts like Chevron got uh, got got conducted. You know, so there are you know stories about, for example, the intermediary. I think it was named James Griffin, wasn't he? The CIA uh, actor. Uh, well. At uh, CIA, anyway, uh, somehow was 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 um, was seen as as instrumental 
in uh, in in pushing the the, the Chevron deal and the Tengiz uh, uh, contract. So there are those kinds of accounts, and uh, and uh, I think I think I think they 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 help to provide extra level of detail. Which, 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 which I think is, is, is kind of important. Um, and so I have, have no problem with, with that. Uh, but again, you know, one doesn't need to, uh, I suppose, what were they trying to achieve, right? And what were the effects? What they were trying to achieve was volunteer control. And what were the effects? Well, I said, the, the effect that I've already highlighted. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't necessarily I think I think I think whilst 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 it's sometimes important to get the details about who the individuals are, one also has to pay attention to the structural conditions, the, the, the structural positions, and so the structural nature of the of of, of economic relationship is as important as trying to personalise uh, capitalism. So you know, so so I see this quite a lot within uh, Central Asia uh, scholarship, for instance, where they start talking about uh, paternalism. Uh, paternalism neo neo patrimonial capitalism or crony capitalism and you know trying to link uh, uh, relationships as if it's all about just who you know well yeah okay well that that's useful but again you know uh, you also want to know what are the structures what are the structural positions in which these individuals fill in and and what I hopefully I try to show in in, in, in this paper is that the structural positions are those of rentiership Right, that's more important. That's the that's that that tends to get missed out in trying to kind of personalize capitalism. Um, um, and 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 just on your point about uh, uh, the grassroots movements in uh, 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 about the anti debt movement in Kazakhstan, that was also actually interestingly uh, uh, led by led by women as well. Um, uh, I mean, if. If Amira was, was was here, she would provide you a much better explanation of why that is the case. Uh, I, I, I dare not do justice to to, to her uh, what, what what she would have said. I suspect it's like with many things; it is gendered politics, gendered around uh, 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 responsibility, gendered norms about you know the safeguarding of the home, safeguarding of the of of, of the house, and and how this becomes a the legitimate concern of women. Uh, which then allows them extra legitimacy to perform politics in the public sphere without being uh, discredited or delegitimized by the state. Because the women then can say, but, it's, but it, we've got to care for our children. We've got to care for our home. How can the state not deny that? Right? So I think, I, think, I think there is a gendered politics going on there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I have to be also fair to the other people that are asking. So I will ask you to keep it like both the questions and the answer, answers um, coincide. Uh, but yeah, no, it's very interesting and we can definitely talk about this forever. Um, uh, so, um, second quad and then Farwa. And then we'll have Esse, then Maureen and then Diana. So quad and then Farwa. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, hi Balihar. Uh, thank you very much. I again enjoyed your presentation very much. I already before that I enjoyed your article. Um, so I, I kind of have this advantageous position. My name is Kuat. Uh, I'm currently a lecturer at Birmingham, Birmingham University in the UK, but uh, now back in Astana as an associate professor at Kazgu local university. Uh, so my I, I'm my research interest concerns financialization, and in my research, I deal a lot with uh, neoliberalism and neoliberal restructuring. So my uh, 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 main interest in this, in your like brilliant research about uh, rentier capitalism, is uh, how this neoliberal restructuring started and has been evolving, you know, in our countries in Central Asia and and, and, and Europe broadly. By the way, and um, I'm mostly interested now uh, when you you mentioned this kind of construction of social norms and legitima legitimization um, of them. Or, you okay? Yeah, construction of social norms and legit legitimization of those institutions and even the language. So we know that uh, during this neoliberal restructuring. 
there has been a lot of a kind of uh, epistemic shift, right, in our knowledge, in what we know or should know. Uh, and uh, one of the main actors where and have been epistemic communities, you, you know, the uh, the academic communities, if you want, maybe their irrelevance, may, maybe their lack of uh, sophistication in those discussions. But mm, it is interesting to to now from the perspective for in retrospect to see how this new language uh, has been transformed and and you know there's so many euphemisms in our countries you know official legal one and people take them for granted like euphemisms like flex, uh, flexible labor market yeah you know which cuts the uh, social achievements of the population a uh, self-employed population it's a very official language which actually means uh, un unemployment, uh, which for the last 20 years has been on the like two, two million people or something. And they are all called self-employed. They are out of the economy. They don't pay taxes. They don't have enjoy any social protection. What is more interesting is that how this uh, legitimation and construction of social norms has been created both from inside, from locals, and also imposed. So like recently I have noticed that well, there are a lot of talks and criticisms on the popular level. It's all about the West, which imposed those norms, you know, blah, 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 that the role of IMF and the World Bank, the institutional financial, uh, the global financial institutions. But it's interesting how the global, uh, the, excuse me, popular culture also constructed it. I don't know, but I would like, I would love to hear your comments on that. Like, for example, in the popular culture, I remember back in 1990s, uh, one of the, uh, very pretty much a popular English uh, book, you know, uh, became very popular in, in, in former so, uh, socialist countries, like Gun by the Wind. Uh, you know, there were a lot of translations of books which were prohibited during during the Soviet time, right? But this one wasn't prohibited, but then it was translated and it became so popular. And now from uh, from this perspective, right, from the perspective of moral economy or political or radical policy economy, it's so funny to see, but it's not very funny to understand that how this uh, Hollywood movie and the story itself kind of legitimized, you know, the ideals of Sarah Hara, who says, I am going to, to steal and kill and I will do whatever is needed, to, you know, not to be hungry. And that kind of mm. connotated very closely with a lot of people in 1990s in, in, in countries like Russia and, and Kazakhstan, like, oh, look, Look, this is the new world, you know, you have to kill and steal if you want to live, these kind of things. More recently, another popular movie like In Pursuance of Happiness, where uh, Will Smith starred. Again, very popular one, how, you know, um, a, 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 a single father, you know, uh, you know, didn't have any jobs. He had to sleep uh, in, the to in public toilets with his uh, five-year-old son. And, you know, the kind of happy end story, how he studied and worked hard and everybody's happy at the end because he became millionaire. And there's very little talks and discussion why why on earth in the 20th century in, in one of the richest countries in the world, someone is running on the streets, you know, trying to find a job. You know, his son, the, the, the system doesn't provide any social protection. Nobody cares about his five-year-old son. He has to leave it, you know, in a kind of unprofessional kindergartens. You know, uh, he doesn't know whether he will eat or not. And we're talking about, again, the wealthiest country. So it is interesting how, again, those social norms are normalized and legitimized. So I'm sorry for my long conversation. So please, any comments on that? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, no, no, you, you're spot on. No, no, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything more that I can add. Um, uh, but you're right. I mean, there is a lot of what's called double speak, isn't there? Um, uh, what what Orwellian double speak uh, uh, a term that um, uh, Michael Hudson uses to describe neoliberalism? How certain terms are used, which 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 have one meaning but have been turned to mean something else. So you know, so I'll give you the example. For example, uh, uh, the, the example of uh, the free market. You know, on one hand, it means X, right? You know, around uh, around free of um, uh, uh, rent. But then how this is then used to mean something totally different. So it becomes a double speak. Uh, but there are other, other examples, isn't there? I mean, so I mean, uh, think about the term 
entrepreneurship, how that gets bandied about, right? Entrepreneurship, you know, so we expect uh, uh, um, um, uh, people who acquire debts to be entrepreneurial uh, or to set up a uh, small micro, micro enterprise company, but these aren't entrepreneurial at all. They're just uh, petty, petty trading, uh, you know, buying and selling uh, uh, goods at a very marginal, uh, uh, um, uh, at a very small margin, and they invariably they go out of business. So, but again, this this notion of entrepreneur it conjures up a meaning of something else, doesn't it? But then how this gets incorporated in our everyday discourses and 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 then language, uh, but also the language of choice, the language of you know uh, that that gets used, the freedom, and then this was internalized. I think I think a lot of I um, mean speaking uh, you know interviewing. Uh, 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 um, a lot of participants in, you know, I've been doing research in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan for, for, for a good decade, over a decade or so. And it is surprising how they have internalized, just as they've done in the West, as Monty was saying, right? In that sense, there is no dissimilarity here, but they have internalized that language, that neoliberal discourse, what's sometimes called neoliberal, neoliberal subjectivism, uh, subjectivities. Why? I suspect it's partly to do with trying to make a virtue out of necessity. What else can they do but to, but to you know, accept uh, that which you know, they can't do anything about? So it's probably that sense of resignation. Um, but yeah, but, uh, but I, I totally agree with, with everything that you said. On, on just the one point uh, that you talked about um, uh, how uh, often the case of Individuals uh, and uh, within the within Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, how they use uh, uh, their own cultures to legitimize rotation. So, so, so let me give you an example of this. So um, when we were talking about buying and selling uh, uh, money, effectively that's what banks do, right? They 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 they, they sell debt to us. And so when I then asked, uh, you know, how do you justify this? They said, well, look, it, it's, it's in our tradition. You know, we are, we, are, we are a culture of buying and selling, of traders. This is what we've always done, uh, you know, pre-Soviet, uh, uh, pre, pre you know, the Silk Road. So they start giving the history about the Silk Road trade. And so this comes a way of justifying volunteer activities, this earned, earned income that, uh, that, that took place. Thank you very much. Then we have Farwa. Yeah, thank you very much, Balihar. It was very um, interesting and the analysis was, uh, yeah, it was fascinating what's happening in Central Asia. I have very two uh, short two questions. The first is that this uh, looking at Central Asia, the transition from socialism to capitalism and what's happening in between this expansion of frontierism. Would you say that there is something uh, exceptional or different about this region because you know if you think about Russia for example you have the same story in a different way perhaps um, ex you know losing export controls liberalization of import permits and giving it to certain uh, interest groups for example um, and Central Asia may be uh, the way I understand it very little understanding but there is still state involvement um, a major major part of these economies is state involvement so if you could just speak a little bit about that reorientation Secondly, would you have something to say about uh, the trends post 2008? Um, so, uh, and, I, and I say this because thinking about uh, the fact that there is ongoing financialization, there is a deepening of um, linkages happening between um, the so-called North and, 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 the, and then the South. But um, there is also a sense in which um, some scholars think that there is some, something still to be redeemed from uh, developing countries in terms of them having a chance at manufacturing or productive investments. So just wondering where you think Central Asia lies in that. Thanks. OK, great. And uh, thanks for uh, two, again, uh, uh, very, very uh, good comments and, and questions. Um, Firstly, yes, you're right. Uh, I mean, the, the the pattern that I've described can can also be used to describing other uh, post-Soviet space as well. Russia uh, would be would be a a, a good example, uh, and of course, uh, in, in 
in, in many ways, the kind of analysis that I'm, that I'm doing is, is kind of what's, what's sometimes called uh, um, a uh, moving from simple, simple abstract where you highlight key features. In this case, I've highlighted the feature of rotation and then how you move from the simple abstract to the uh, complex concrete, right? And in doing so, you, you try to bring in the nuance, the specificities of the context uh, and to see how these are, these are likely to be different from different contexts. So in Russia's case, it's likely to be different to the case of, of Central Asia. Uh, but, but the general pattern is likely to be quite familiar as well, right? Because the, the abstract of rontiership is still there. So, um, so, I, so, so I think, I think, I think we do have to acknowledge that, you know, whilst, whilst sometimes, sometimes the history and the cultures may be, may be different, there's a lot of degree of similarity that's going across the world. Um, again, I'm, 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 I'm a bit reluctant to share some of my colleagues who work in Central Asia to somehow think that Central Asia is so unique that it's got nothing to learn from the experiences and, uh, and events happening elsewhere. That's far from the case. Uh, we need to look at uh, the experiences, uh, the, the effects of policies, whether it be uh, uh, economic policies, political, uh, uh, political developments, and then to see what, what kind of effects, impact it has had on Central Asia. Um, you, you are right, but of course the, the, uh, I, I suppose the, 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 Pacific, the, the Pacific nature of uh, Central Asia, uh, Kazakhstan in particular, is the, the huge influence of natural resources, I think. That makes it quite distinct from the experience of Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan doesn't have anything like the natural resources that uh, Kazakhstan has. Um, and so there are similarities, so there are differences in how rontiership has developed. So as I was saying uh, during my talk, rontiership has more developed around property ownership, real estate, and, 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 and microfinance in Kyrgyzstan. Whereas in Kazakhstan, it was more around banking um, that was particularly pertinent. So there are these kind of uh, uh, nuances that, uh, that occur. Um, and to your point about um, uh, uh, about what are the possibilities for different kind of trajectory, uh, what is what is interesting about Central Asia is that it's a, it's, it's a site of clearly it's been a site in which the Washington consensus has predominated. Neoliberalism has predominated the way in which uh, acquisition is uh, has, has, has been acquired, how it's thought, how it's been defended, and also the nature of what property means invariably around uh, uh, exchange value and what I what what I kind of called in property. But there are alternative economic imaginaries as well. Uh, and the two economic imaginaries that I've been trying to uh, uh, both myself and and, and Almeida have been trying to work on it's it's one on the uh, Eurasian economic Union, which is Russian led, and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is which is a Chinese uh, which is which is led by by China, and these seemingly offer a different way of thinking about production, not so much around it doesn't emphasise rent extraction as much as the two other economic imaginaries of uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is more about trying to uh, improve infrastructure uh, 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 and the, uh, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union is more trying to uh, increase uh, the productive capacity of the Central Asian economy. And what's interesting, and, 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 and this is a fact that, uh, that tends to get missed out, is that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union was was, was partially responsible for bringing down usurious exchange rates in central in, in Kyrgyzstan, especially in Kyrgyzstan, uh, through the work of the uh, Russian Kyrgyz Development Fund, because the Russian Kyrgyz Development Fund offered uh, uh, loans at where, where, where normally it would be like 20, 30 percent. They were offering interest rates at 7 percent. Because they argued they felt that, and, and they were owning financing, they were only giving funds and projects for productive capital as opposed to unproductive capital. 
So I think there are these differences. Uh, there may be differences in degrees rather than of kind, but I think it's important to recognize that there are these competing economic imaginaries, the Western led uh, 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 um, neoliberalism, Western consensus, the Russian uh, Eurasian Economic Union, and China, uh, the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, um, very interesting. We're gonna have another talk about it, maybe. Like, yeah, uh, essay. Do you wanna say it? Um, ask your question yeah. to yourself? Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. It's Thank a you new action in sociology. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. I'm sociology, Open University. Thank you very much for your talk and for your research. I didn't have time to read your article. Perhaps you unpack the question that I'm going to ask in your article. But I am familiar with the initial research uh, conducted on Middle East, on the rentier capitalism in oil rich countries of the Middle East. And this research initially highlighted how uh, those oil gas revenues uh, established a specific form of uh, state as well as uh, culture and religion, as well as gender regime and capital accumulation strategy. But Afterwards, there has been a significant critique addressing the essentialist tendencies of those studies, like how they ignored external interventions, how they ignored uh, the significance of state formation, and they simply said that uh, oil gas revenues do not necessarily le lead to this form of socio-economic transformation. So when I listened to your research, I didn't also hear lots of, uh, I didn't hear enough about the significance of, for example, the post-colonial dynamics or state formation uh, in terms of the post-Soviet co uh, context. So I wonder uh, what do you think about the essentialism critique and how, how does it make sense in, or if does it make sense in your research? Yeah, I mean, um, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. And I don't see how I'll be able to do justice to that. Um, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the Middle East, uh, the Middle East uh, context. Um, though, of course, I'm aware that some of those states, you know, are also called uh, Rontier states as well. Um, I, think, I think this is a, a, a rich uh, avenue to go into, especially around the post-colonial literature around uh, the post-service space. Um, and I suppose I would, I would just like to add, and, then, and I suppose this was the point that I was trying to make towards the end about the implications, the theoretical implications. I, I have noticed a tendency for, of, of certain colleagues uh, to somehow decenter the state, uh, to talk about the state as if it's the, the, the territorial doesn't doesn't matter anymore and that is just uh, uh, you know we now live in a kind of a global global economy in which uh, territorial state or the nation state no longer has the same meaning or significance as they used to. I think this is a mistake for two reasons. Um, firstly because the state still has significant power, still has importance in who gets to pay rent and how the rent is shared down. Is still done through the state, uh, uh, you know, using Bob Jessup's uh, notion of the state, the state as a site of contestation of local social forces. I think this is the way we, we need to think about it. Um, so, uh, so I think what this is the way I would I, I tend to approach state formation as a continual struggle between various forces, some domestic, some elites, but also uh, uh, some uh, grassroots movements, uh, as well as international actors, the IMF, World Bank. Uh, you know, it is it is it is a complex it is a complex situation in which you have different actors imposing its will, its uh, its 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 rules, um, and uh, yeah, I think I think I think. Uh, I don't, I don't think I've got anything more to, more to add to than that, other than to say that it is a fascinating area to look into. Yeah, we might need comparative studies on that. It would be very interesting. Then we have Maureen. Let me just turn 
see if, if, if I can turn this on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ballyharrow, it's lovely to see you. Um, <laughs> I'm Maureen, I'm a, one, of the, one of the Open University economists and therefore long ago a colleague of Bally House in the OU. So this is a real pleasure. Um, I've, Bally Howard, I love I loved the talk. Um, I've actually got just one specific question and it is a bit specific, but I think it's interesting. Kyrgyzstan, that list of the 10 top um, richest individuals, um, not Kazakhstan, but Kyrgyzstan, one of them, the top one had a mon what looked like a monopoly in pharmaceutical trade. There it is, pharmaceutical trade. And I was interested in that for two, two or three reasons. One is that um, there's been some work by the WHO on the fact that whatever you seem to do in terms of policy in Kyrgyzstan, the prices of medicines never go down. Oh. Um, the but more, which sort of, you know, <laughs> here we have a possible explanation. Um, but also, <clears throat> more generally, um, what's the role in rentier capitalism of control of what you might call life and death trade, of trade, control of trade in essential commodities? Um, and pharmaceuticals, of course, is a classic. You know, how does this fit the kind of rentier model? And I suppose the the related query is, you know, health is, you know, if if the state is a, a site for contestation, another site for contestation is always health. It's one of those because it's life and death. It's one of those areas where it, this stuff emerges. So is there something around areas like health, which you know, how do they interconnect with rentierism? I just thought interesting. Okay, great. Firstly, just to say what a privilege it is to have you uh, uh, and to meet you again, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, We've been going back a long, long way. Very long uh, way. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, one of my first questions to, to, to Lorena was, 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 was would, would, would Maureen be joining us? Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, it, really is, it really is an honour and as I said, it's a shame oh, that it. I can't stop be it. there. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, your, uh, but your question is, 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 is an excellent one. And I think uh, the way it, uh, it works is through uh, monopolising supplies. Who gets to supply certain hospitals? So it's the licensing, it's a who gets the contracts, how these contracts are negotiated. And uh, what happens is that the state, uh, the, the Department of Health only issues certain individuals with licenses and contracts to supply the hospitals and the clinics. So, um, so, uh, yeah. so, 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 and then in doing so, they're then able to jack up the prices because they know that, uh, that they're the only licensee. Uh, mm. So it's almost like, you know, granting uh, feudal privileges, like, so privileges yeah. that used to exist to like, you know, like the 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 South Indian, no, no, uh, the South Indian company. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but, but yeah, during the yeah. British Raj, you know how, yeah, yeah. how how certain trades were, were monopolized by certain. Yeah. Um, so 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 that's at one level, right? It's it's, it's through uh, licensing and um, thereby preventing other people from licensing those. Uh, hospitals and clinics. The other thing is, uh, is, is the setup of the uh, pharmaceutical chains. So on the high street, there are only certain companies that are able to uh, uh, occupy uh, uh, positions. Re uh, yeah, okay. And, yeah. and thereby then getting a, a natural natural monopoly rent. Yeah. Because because you know there isn't one in every you know because they. Especially if it's a shopping mall or or or, or, or an intersection of a busy uh, uh, crossroad, then you know being really central helps to get your footfall and thereby to 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 to, to get rent. I mean, I do remember uh, uh, when I was going with my wife, uh, uh, Almira, we were getting uh, various uh, medical products. How the prices varied mm -hmm. geographically, spatially, because of spatial monopoly. Yeah. You know, you know, you get to the center and it's like really expensive. But then, you know, and then I think my mother-in-law said, no, 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 you shouldn't be getting in there. You should be going, you know, 10 miles out of the city. That's very cheap. And so, you know, so, yeah. So I think I think I think these are the two elements. Firstly, it's around the, the licenses of the contracts to supply, but also the spatial monopolies of the pharmaceutical uh, uh, companies of the of the of the shops and the chains. And how, how this helps with with, with one issue. And it, is it contested? Is it is it contested? 
Not really, no. Okay, right. That's I mean, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the only form of contestation occurs is, uh, um, well, I suppose, what you call the contestation, um, people unable to afford uh, uh, expensive drugs then then resort to cheap alternatives, yeah. which, are, which 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 may not be. Which are dodgy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's, so there is a, so there is a, a trade, a, a kind of a, a black, a black market, for, for you but know cheaper, no, but, but not then, you know you don't know what it is that you're getting. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and then uh, what was this one? Um, no, that was it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of monopolizing trade in essentials as part of rentier capitalism how that worked so you know yeah, yeah, yeah. vile vile licensing being the answer basically thanks yeah. cheers hope to see you soon physically yeah, you too. Uh, absolutely i'm really <laughs> glad i made the connection again so. <laughs> uh, we have one more question from diana okay i'm a lucky one thank you so much <laughs> Thank you, Valihar, for the fantastic talk, as usual. So much to learn, so insightful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lorena, for organizing it. Um, well, I should um, introduce myself. My name is Diana. I'm a fellow sociologist, GCRF Compass Research Associate here at Cambridge and uh, working with Montu and Project Seed. So uh, my question is, and I found it very fascinating when you were talking about the, um, the, the contracts in the early 90s and how that language of stability uh, cause of what do we call clauses and and sort of development and so on how this language very neoliberal language and very um foreign language to the post-soviet reality and talking about you know change of systems and change of economic systems as well how it creeped into the political discourse and the elites started talking with the same discourse of how we need to keep political uh, i mean different types of stabilities and i'm wondering if you and elmira conceptualize it somehow um and if you like you know engage in this um how this discourse then becomes um quite quite powerful and travels beyond economy and becomes uh, enters the political field. I would be very interested. Thank you. So, uh, so before you go, uh, Diana, can, yep. can, you, can you just um, uh, uh, just clarify what you mean by discourses of stability? Can, can you just say what you um, mean? Well, you know, like, I, I don't know. I think in Kyrgyzstan, at least I, when I looked at that kind of era, he does talk about it as well. But the Nazarbayev, uh, throughout his rule, it's, it's a very big component of his uh, um discourses i mean i wouldn't call it ideology but it's definitely the presidential discourse where he talks in speeches when he addresses the nation uh when when whenever there is like a like you know development program like Kazakhstan 2030 Kazakhstan 2050 and so on uh there is a specific political discourse that they're developing and this discourse is mainly directed to the idea of economic prosperity and oh, stability yes. in terms of political stability but also in general in into ethnic stability so it becomes quite an encompassing concept in the political language of the regime so i'm really interested if you look into that thank you yeah yeah no that's um um i i, I suspect diana you you're probably better apt to answer the question yourself rather than me um i really don't have that much to to, to say i mean I'm, again it's a, it, it is a good question um but it's not something that i that i uh, that i worked on um but I suppose, I mean, one thing that I would like to say is that um, it's not merely about discourse, is it? isn't it? I mean, uh, the state isn't just merely an operator of discursive acts. It's also a, 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 a violent actor. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen, both Amir and I, is the, the, repressive, the, the repressive nature yes. of, of the state and how the state has ensured, not merely by discursive performative acts or, or, uh, or, or, uh, or such like tactics, but through repression, through violence, it has ensured stability. Um, and, and, and I think when we were uh, uh, looking at the uh, uh, grassroots movement, the, the, double, the double movements, um, especially when we're think, looking at the, the land, the informal land settlement movements, how, for example, in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, the state uh, bulldozed uh, the, the, the settlements in, in, in Shanarak, mm -hmm. which you may be familiar in 2005. You know, this wasn't a discursive act. This was a violent act. 
which 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 uh, 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 deprived people of their basic right to to to, uh, to housing, um, and and how the state has been continuous in its repressive measures against the illegal residents, illegal uh, uh, migrants who occupy the informal settlements, uh, trying to intimidate them, trying to uh, um, force them out, evict them. And one of the interesting things that, that, that is also done, because the, what the state is trying to do, especially in, in Astana, is uh, trying to acquire these very central locations for uh, for international development, for you know development of of luxurious building or shopping malls. So it, it gave out temporary uh, contracts, leases to the residents, with the view that after ten years they would be evicted, and that the, the the power of the state, the police, would evict them. So so I think that there are these you know it's again what 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 best what Bob Jessup would, would, would kind of argue, would call it, drawing upon Gramsci. Mm. You can't just think of the state as merely a, a, a kind of hegemonic, kind of discursive actor. It's also one is is is, is uh, uh, amount with uh, with 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 violence and repression. Mm. Um, and then we and then you only have to uh, think about uh, Jean Eugen. That was mm. another case in which uh, the state brutalized. Uh, the, 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 the protesters. Now that's usually seen as, as, as if it was, you know, just troublemakers, but it, it was an, a long ongoing dispute between the workers and the subcontractors uh, about working conditions. And that sometimes gets left out in the accounts around Jean uh, So the violence of the state is used to ensure the stability and security of investors in Central Asia. Thank you. Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, let me see. Is there any very short question that the audience would like to ask? If not, uh, we are about to close. There are like just one minute left. But I mean, thank you for the excellent talk and discussion. It's been very, very, very interesting. First of all, because it's like it really shows how we really need more research on Central Asia, and how you know each country has its own ecological, natural, uh, and institutional specificity that sometimes I mean are completely forgotten so looking at Central Asia as a whole is a little bit misleading like what you were talking about like you know, Kyrgyzstan is completely different from like, Kazakhstan although it's very also from Uzbekistan especially but it also is in interesting how from the question and from the, in the interdisciplinary uh, question that have been posed we can actually draw patterns uh, across continents mm -hmm. and um, yeah no very 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 good um, I just need to, so I thank you very hard again and feel free to come and join to present the next talk. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we have uh, our Twitter account uh, that um, I will uh, tell you right now, at intdev uh, underscore OU, and we will share um, evaluate feedback form uh, for you guys to give us some feedback about uh, the form and the content if you want to suggest uh, any, um, any more talk on uh, related topics or completely different. Uh, so without, I let you go. I know we are all very busy uh, with other less interesting uh, teaching or admin duties. And um, hope to see you soon. And let's keep in touch, Balihar. Yes, yeah, thank you. And then thank you, Lorena. And thank you for all the questions. They were really great. Yeah. Questions. And apologies if I didn't do justice to those questions. Um, no, you but, did. But, but, but you certainly gave me thought. Uh, 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 food for thought anyway, so thank you, yeah. thank you for that. We have 35 participants, so I mean, it's a clearly a very interesting talk, so very nice. All right, enjoy thank the you. rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Cheers, cheers, guys. Cheers. Great Bye. to see you all. Cheers, thank you again, Lauren. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, too. Bye.